Hi guys, and welcome back to the Rare Wellness Podcast, the podcast designed to help you heal holistically and give you the tools that you need to thrive. We're making it easy to understand medicine and wellness with practical steps from the experts, one podcast at a time. The only thing that we ask is that if this podcast helps you live just a little bit better and more aligned, that you'll leave us a review and share it with a friend. That's all that we ask so that we can continue to provide you with free, valuable knowledge from the experts of well-being. So today we have our functional medicine specialist, Dr. Guthrie, coming back on. Um, I've absolutely loved every single conversation I've had with you. Thank you so much for uh, being here today. You're welcome. It's a yeah. pleasure. So I'm really excited to talk about um, hormones today and particularly men's hormones and understanding, you know, like why does testosterone matter is what, whether it's too high or too low and fat cells and all, all the things that go into that, which is some for the average person we're just not aware of. So I just did an episode on women's hormones and today we're going to get into men's hormones. I'm really excited. Yeah. yeah um, I mean, you, you almost could call it just a testosterone lecture because uh, that's where we're going to focus. I think all of our time men have other hormones. I mean, we've got yeah, uh, yeah. thyroid hormones. We have uh, adrenal hormones. Uh, we're going to talk a bit about adrenal hormones today, but um we're going to focus on testosterone because there's so much information and so many uh, wrinkles in it. Absolutely. So let's dive right into it. Why does testosterone matter? Um, yeah, why does it matter? Well, um, testosterone in a man, if the testosterone levels are low, it leads to an increase in uh, metabolic syndrome, which is basically hypertension, diabetes, insulin resistance, and central obesity. Um, and you recognize several of those as the main chronic illnesses that end up causing people to consume healthcare dollars, medication dollars, and, uh, and to die early. So low testosterone levels really matter health-wise. They also matter mm. life-wise. Men who have low testosterone tend to have a very low libido and you know, low sex drive. And it, generally speaking, it doesn't bother them. Why? Because they have low testosterone. It's not interesting anymore. <laughs> and mm -hmm. their spouses, on the other hand, or partners otherwise, uh, particularly at the age 50, 60, who are a, a woman's sexual life is actually reaching possibly its very peak through their entire life wow, about wow. That age, um, depending upon their hormonal status, which uh, that's not today's subject, but um, they'll often get to complaining. Now that was, uh, well, I, that's, a, that's a story of uh, our life, mine and my wife's life, about 10 years ago. Um, I didn't really care. Things weren't working that well, but it was not of that much interest. Uh, and due to her complaints, I went and did some research and went looking. And I, my testosterone, having been at the below the lowest end of normal, my testosterone level is now in the upper two thirds of normal, and I don't take wow. testosterone. So that's something that's really important for people to get up front. Is if you go to see a urologist or a and that's usually the person you end up talking with or your family doctor about low testosterone. They'll test it. It's low. They'll give you testosterone, which is fine, except it shuts off all your testosterone factories. So you're kind of become dependent on the system. You're going to have to see the doctor, get your prescription and uh, and monitor the levels. Um, there are ways to do that. We're going to talk about today ways to get your testosterone back towards normal or within normal probably not above normal, but to do that without requiring intervention from the uh, healthcare system. If your total testosterone is under 300 or your free testosterone is less than 50, then you're, by definition, you have low testosterone and it will, it will impact you both symptoms and long-term health, like we discussed. I'm going to briefly mention too high of testosterone because too high of testosterone increases your cardiac risk significantly. Your risk of heart attack goes way up and uh, aggression, anger, and uh, other mm, social problems come along with the high testosterone as well. I'd like folks to first of all kind of understand 
how hormones work. The hormone is produced somewhere in the body and it flow, it gets released into the bloodstream and there's a, a dump truck that carries it around the bloodstream called uh, binding globulin, whatever hormone binding globulin, thyroid hormone binding globulin. In this case, sex hormone binding globulin, all of the sex hormones, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, are carried by this carrier molecule. And while it's attached to that molecule, while it's in the dump truck, you can't have it. It's not available for you to use. So um, there's always two parts is how much am I making and how much is stuck in the dump truck? So we can increase the amount that you're making and we can decrease the number of dump trucks running around carrying it so that there's more free testosterone available for the cells to use. I, don't know, I think that should be helpful as we go through the discussion. Um, the difference between total testosterone and free testosterone is the dump truck effect. Mm -hmm. The total is how much have you got. The free is how much is not being carried. So it's mm -hmm. available for use. When it comes to looking at your symptoms and do I need to do something and what should I be trying to do, having both of those numbers really matters. Because if your total mm -hmm. testosterone is up in the mid-normal range, but your free testosterone is way down low, then really what we need to do is get that sex hormone binding globulin level down, mm -hmm. right? And if your, uh, if your total testosterone is quite low, but your free testosterone is also in that about that same amount of low, then we don't have to think so much about the sex hormone binding globulin, at least not yet. Right? Which is why it's so important to go into a specialist to get the blood work done right to be able to see these things well i wouldn't say a specialist uh, a, a reasonably educated family practice doctor who paid attention to hormone lectures and, or has done further study or research after that um should be able to walk you through the basic this is what the numbers you have and what they mean um in terms of knowing what to do about it it's useful to have somebody who understands it now, if that specialist is a naturopath or a, uh, uh, or a family doctor uh, or an endocrinologist, you'll get very different approaches, first off. Um, and uh, uh, I encourage my patients to know their numbers and to make their choices and to manage their own testosterone levels. Because once you have a bit of a framework for that, it's not that many numbers or that many things to work on. Absolutely. Yeah. Today's podcast is brought to you by the Premium Center for Regenerative Medicine and Stem Cell Therapy in the Northwest. Northwest Center for Regenerative Medicine. Get back to the activities that you love without needing surgery. You can book your appointment at nwc4rm.com. Again, that's nwc4rm.com. This podcast is also brought to you by Rare Wellness Supplements. You can head over to rareplanethealth.com to get your supplements. My personal favorite is the premium fish oil filled with omega-3s. Again, you can go to rareplanethealth.com and get the supplements that you most need to support your health and wellness today. Lastly, this podcast is also brought to you by Rare Wellness. Rare Wellness is located on the South Hill in Spokane and is one center that provides all the wellness tools that you could need. Whether you're looking for a hands-on premium intimate yoga studio with a therapeutic emphasis, bar classes, Tai Chi classes. If you're looking for skincare treatments, injectable, hydrofacial, microneedling, organic spa treatments. If you're wanting to get therapeutic massaged or book functional medicine appointments to get down to the root cause of your inflammation, Rare Wellness is the place for you. Whatever your wellness needs are, they have it covered. So to book your appointment today, go to rarewellness.com. Again, go to rarewellness.com and mention this podcast for 10% off when you're booking. Okay, time to get back to the episode. I'll digress to a, uh, my own personal example again. What I did to make that tremendous change in my testosterone level from below normal to the upper two thirds of the normal range was to lose about 15 to 20 pounds increase a little bit my muscle mass and start taking DHEA, which is a hormone building molecule. It's one of the mm -hmm. things in the pathway that gets turned into hormones. And uh, that was it. Did you take it as a supplement, the DHEA? 
Still do, yeah. I take it every day. That's uh, along with my vitamin D3. That's my, you know, don't leave home without it. That's awesome. It's, yeah. it's going with me on the Antarctic cruise because I don't care what my weight restrictions are or space. That's something that goes with me because right? it's something that you want to keep, keep the factories running. So for those supplements, if people, can they just go to the drugstore and get them? Right. The, the pharmacy might have it, but where you're going to is, uh, is a health food store or a supplement shop. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, I don't have any stock in what they do or sell, but uh, Vitacost is a company that has a huge supplement range and uh, carry different brands. Uh, there are nutraceutical companies such as Thorn Research, Pure Encapsulations, some of those that will have, you know, uh, probably a higher level of purity, a more guaranteed exact amount in each dose. On the other hand, if you just stick with the brand that you started with and they don't change too much and you adjust until your levels are where you want them, you'll be about where you would want to be. The one other thing I think people need to realize, though, is that um there's a chart and you it'd be worth uh, folks just pulling it up and looking at it um sex hormone metabolism how are they made and how are they metab how are they gotten rid of there are probably 20 different hormones on that chart intermediate ones that don't do any work uh, there's about 10 to 15 different enzymes that do it, and their little arrows, as you look at the chart, the little arrows go uh, both ways, mm -hmm. which means if you push anywhere in the hormone soup, as I like to call it, if you push anywhere, everything moves. So there's no free lunch, there's no, anytime you increase one thing, you'll decrease another thing or increase another other thing downstream. So it's, it's worth being cautious and it's in my opinion dangerous to add hormones straight into your body mm. right? because then you're you're pushing the system to go somewhere else now if you that's not female hormones push putting um female hormones in and checking the metabolism out by doing urine levels and making sure and blood levels and make sure that you're not pushing too hard one way or another that's perfectly safe, but to just do it at home, not so much. The beauty of using over-the-counter supplements, most of them anyways, is that you're, and you're allowing your body to do its job and it has its own built-in safety measures. Mm -hmm. Which I love how you said you were able to increase your testosterone without getting mm -hmm. those injections because I feel like very often those injections or are sometimes the first thing that's pushed when there are ways to do it in a in a more natural way. So um, yeah, that's like, it's, it's super exciting. And you know, I just filmed another episode on preventative medicine. And it's, it's, it's just amazing how much you can do with the lifestyle and supplements before you go to needing those external sources. So another thing that's useful to understand about this hormone soup is, is in sex hormones, there's basically two sides. There's the estrogen, testosterone, progesterone side, right? And there's the cortisol side, right? Mm -hmm. uh, everything starts from a cholesterol molecule and DHEA sits way up on top and it can go either way. But mm -hmm. the take home message that most people really need to understand is that if you make more cortisol than your body is designed to do, you're going to reduce your sex hormones, the estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone, and you're gonna have symptoms from that. And you ask most any woman who's experiencing hot flashes, what will trigger an increase in hot flashes? It's a stressful event, especially a poorly managed stressful event. So stress management becomes a very important part of an adrenal support a whole different yeah. talk we can do another time but adrenal support becomes very important because if you're pulling it down the cortisol side it's not going over to the other side and most of us yeah. don't have enough building blocks to go both ways maximum all out 
right? It's called the cortisol steal syndrome because cortisol is stealing the building blocks over to its side of the equation. Yeah, so how do fat cells affect your hormones? You talked about losing weight and its impact on your testosterone levels. So how does that work? Right. Well, the, sh the short answer actually is that fat cells contain an enzyme called aromatase. And aromatase, one of its jobs in the body is to take testosterone and turn it into estrogen. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's actually, it just dissolves a little aromatic carbon ring that's not all that interesting on a diagram, but the difference between testosterone and estrogen is huge. Many men who've been in a shower, a group shower with other men have noticed that the larger the man, fat wise, the smaller the genitals seem to be. And that's not just perspective. That's actually a lot of estrogen, not a lot of testosterone. Okay. So that, that's a very real subject, and it's very important because if a person has significant stores of intra-abdominal or around-the-body fat and they take DHEA, they won't raise their testosterone levels. What they'll do is raise their estrogen levels and start getting larger breasts and painful breast tissue and all the things that men don't really care to have unless they're, you know, intentionally trying to turn into a woman, which there are, no, that is a thing, but people, most men are, are trying uh, to functional. raise their testosterone. Right. Right. Exactly. So fat cells really, really matter. Um, in terms of that metabolism. Now the body then takes the estrogen and eventually metabolizes it out and into the urine. And that's kind of how it leaves the body primarily. So fat cells really affect the hormone. And it, you could just think of it simply as testosterone to estrogen. That's what my fat cells do. Got it. And so basically the more, the more fat you have, usually the higher your estrogen levels are. Yes. And let's assume that you're a fairly obese man getting testosterone injections or having the pellets put in. Okay. We're going to, to get your testosterone levels to stay at a level high enough, we're going to have to drive uh, more testosterone into your blood that's going to get turned into estrogen on its way out. So that estrogen, your estrogen levels are going to go up as well. And there's going to be a competing effect in your body and in your mind uh, from those two hormones because you, you're, you're not able to get that testosterone dominance that, mm -hmm. uh, that most men are used to living in. And weight loss, again, that's a whole nother, probably two or three episodes podcast to work on, on, you know, how do I actually get the weight down? But that becomes a very critical piece. And I really don't recommend trying to do a lot of things to raise testosterone until the, the fat, the fat cells are down. Right. Because it'll be counterproductive or not counterproductive, mm -hmm. but it won't be as effective. Yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, that's a great takeaway for people listening. You know, if you're looking to raise your testosterone levels, that's like one of the primary places to start. Get your weight loss. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it may be the only thing that's needed. You know, if you're carrying 40, 50 wow. pounds of extra weight and you get all that fat, uh, well, let's say 80% of that fat off of your body, your testosterone levels may be just fine after a few months. Yeah. Certainly possible. Well, and um, guys, if you're listening, also go check out our one of our previous episodes, Movement as Medicine, um, talking about exactly what Dr. Guthrie just said, um, how, you know, movement is one of the greatest medications that you could take to fix your hormones, your life, your body. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, increasing muscle mass uh, also uh, has there are several mechanisms how that works, but it also increases testosterone level, and that is a kind of a positive feedback loop because as your testosterone levels get higher, you are able to build more muscle mass. That's awesome. I think probably the next place to go in talking about the uh, testosterone is, uh, I think before I talk about how to increase your production and of testosterone and decrease your sex hormone binding globulins, I'd like to mention briefly the endocrine disrupting chemicals. That's the official name, EDCs. Um, most people have heard of um, BPA. Most people know BPA is bad. 
I'm not supposed to have that. Now, that's the stuff that comes out of uh, 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 electricity transformer that's hanging out. That, that thing breaks and leaks and puts PCBs into the ground. Um, so BPA is in a number of different places. Um, uh, they're called bisphenols, but there are other endocrine disrupting chemicals. Bisphenols, phthalates, polychlorinated and polybrominated biphenols, DDT, most of us are familiar with that. We used to use it to keep mosquitoes under control. DDE and DDT and diethyl stilbestrol, which is that one that, you know, when we gave it to women to help their nausea during pregnancy, they had children with deformed limbs. I don't know if you remember the DES crisis a long time ago. We actually oh, used yeah. it as a prescription drug for uh, probably 10 or 15 years wow. if you go back in history. You don't see too many uh, of those babies. Uh, you know, most of the people that that happened to are now aging out of our population, mm -hmm. but we still see a few. Um, so what, these are endocrine disrupting chemicals. Once they get in your body, your body does not have a really effective way to get rid of them. Once they're in the environment, they are essentially permanent. So, um, they soak down through the ground, get in the water system. Chlorine doesn't kill them. Um, heat might if you got enough heat, but it they're very real. And one of the early changes I suggest folks to make is these are these are molecules that actually look almost like estrogen, but they have a slight different tweak to them. Well, what they did, what that means is they'll hook up to an estrogen receptor and stimulate, for example, sex hormone binding globulin production. So your hormone levels go down because the body said, well, we got all this stuff around. We need stuff to carry it. So it makes more sex hormone binding on or it it's may hook up. To a, right. And you might hook it might hook up to an estrogen receptor and just sit there and not really make the estrogen receptor do anything. But now estrogen can't get to that receptor. Or the molecule may have a it, where it hooks the receptor may actually stimulate the estrogen receptor and cause unwanted estrogen effects or testosterone effects. So uh, one of the early and easy things to do is to, well, I shouldn't say easy, <laughs> simple. One of the early and simple things to do is to make sure that the things that you're putting on your skin have no phthalates, no biphenols, no phenols. Uh, it's a fairly short list and you can uh, look up on their websites to give you clean, you know, clean sources, but shampoo and conditioner. Wow. You know, I, my, my list of shampoos and conditioners that I'm willing to put on my head is very, very short and they're moderately expensive, but Do you I don't want recommendations. Oh boy. Um, not off the top of my head, but the Environmental Working Group, the EWG, I don't know if you're familiar with them, but they score all uh, home products, chemicals, uh, just a lot of that kind of stuff. They score, and you can look it up by product or you can look it up by subject, but the EWG, it's a nonprofit, so it probably .org would be my guess, EWG.org. Environmental Working Group is a good place to look. That's where I go. The reason I hesitated is because I used to have one called Pharmaca, where a bunch of pharmacists got together and built a line of products that were you know, safe for the human body. They were actually it paid it. Right. And um, uh, it was sold out of Pharmaca stores. Well, Pharmaca went whatever belly up they went but they closed as a as a corporation about a year and a half ago and i bought out most of their remaining stock personally wow. i think i have 50 or 60 bottles of shampoo and conditioner in my basement because i'm like i don't really want to go looking for somebody else if you go into walmart or costco or wherever you're going to go and go looking down the row uh, of shampoos and conditioners. And if you take out just things that say phthalate, uh, mm -hmm. and um, uh, that's not the only endocrine disruptor that they have in them. But, and then you, uh, if, if you go a second step and refuse ones that say fragments, because, you know, fragrance is just a petrochemical that's been tweaked until it smells like something. And many of those have 
potentially harmful effects in the human body. So if you just take those two things out, you're left with nothing to buy in all your major stores. And that, so then uh, the search gets longer. But that's probably enough time on the endocrine disrupting chemicals. That's more of a, this is a subject people need to look at. They need to engage, get online, uh, become familiar with the environmental working group and their database and, um, and, and make intelligent choices as to not screwing up your hormones. I'm so glad that you're talking about this, Dr. Guthrie, because I feel like it's something that we're just poorly educated about in our society. And there's toxic chemicals in everything. Like you said, absolutely everything. And um, I mean, I know we're talking about men's hormones and or testosterone today, but I know even for for women overall, like as I've been doing a lot of research into myself, every single makeup product I have, have been using for years has so many chemicals that are just so bad. You know, the food, I mean, forget food for a second, but just products, cleaning products, shampoos, conditioners, perfumes. And I didn't realize you can be eating so, you think you're eating clean, you think you're living healthy, and then you have all of these toxic chemicals that are actually disrupting your body's processes and hormone levels on the inside. And it's just such simple changes, but we're just not educated on this topic. And so I'm really, really glad that you're bringing all of this up. Right. We Unfortunately, we live in a society that uh, requires that you prove a thing is unsafe before it gets something Crazy. done about it. You come out with a new chemical, as long as the FDA initially glances at it and says it's presumed safe, then you're good. And uh, I'm sure you're aware that, uh, you know, Roundup by Monsanto, uh, glyphosate, uh, is actually still on the presumed safe list, right? I, I mean, it's in the process of being removed and banned, and there are actually several multi-million dollar settlements now for its ability to cause cancer, but that's the system that we live in. So reducing our exposure wherever we can, sanely and safely. I don't want to make people paranoid, but shampoo and conditioner, most of us use every other day or every day. Hopefully, and it's, we're, yeah. and, it's, and it's going on our scalp, which is an area of the skin that has probably more blood supply than any other area of the skin. So what we put up there has, you know, if it gets through the skin, it's in our blood and it's going around. Wow. Wow. So that matters. Uh, I wanted to bring those up before we um, um, kind of go to production and, and how do I get my testosterone up? What are the things that affect it? So um, the, the first things, um, well, if you smoke, by the way, that's a great, that's a, a strong, powerful anti-testosterone effect from the inflammation, which increases sex hormone binding globulin, but also from the toxic chemicals that are in the cigarette smoke. So uh, that that's a that's a kind of a low-hanging fruit. Um, avoiding as much as possible uh, PCBs, BPA, household chemicals, and pesticides. Now, I should probably mention one more that people don't realize. You know that little receipt that said, do you want a receipt? And you say, yeah, sure. And the little thing goes like that. It, that's heat printing. There's a little thing that generates heat and it goes and it makes those letters that show up on the white paper. Okay, That white paper is coated with BPA. That's how it works. I have heard that that is so toxic, yeah, can, so bad for you. Find, I'm going to find something interesting. Just Google um, recycled paper BPA levels. And if you want to read it in a more scary way, read um, recycled toilet paper BPA levels. Okay, the, the levels are actually fairly high because there's just tons of that heat sensitive paper going into the system. I actually nowadays, every time one of those ends up in the house, I put it in the trash, not in the recycle. Just I'm um, okay. I'm not going to make a big difference in the world, but it's kind of like my it's like taking my glass to the recycling. Yeah, it doesn't make a huge difference, just me, but if but more it compounds. people do it. Yeah. And whenever I can, I ask, please don't print a receipt. Mm -hmm. right, Thank God so, that things are going more digital now so that you don't have to be exposed to those if you don't want to. Yeah. So anyway, that's just reducing those uh, hormone-like toxins, household chemicals, and Pesticides and herbicides, nearly all of them have hormone effects. So um, it, it, reducing your exposure to those will help. Um, 
easy step. I already mentioned stress management tools such as regular exercise, breathing exercises, meditation, ways to, I mean, you don't want to reduce stress really because a, a person with no stress is a dead person. We all experience <laughs> stress. Um, how we manage our stress really matters. So you want to manage your stress in ways that don't burn out cortisol and leave you with plenty of that build, uh, those building blocks for building the other things. And there are other, there's a lot of reasons when we talk about adrenals, we talk about other bad effects running high cortisol levels all the time. There's a lot of health reasons for that, but today we're on productive home. stress. Right. And then some, uh, Dietary supplementation that has been shown to increase total testosterone levels. There are kind of some building blocks that are needed for those enzymes to do their work. Vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin E, zinc, and selenium. So that's the short list of five. Um, there was one study that showed that 60 milligrams of zinc daily increased testosterone and sperm counts. Both. Wow. So, um, uh, the uh, next step is ensuring there's enough uh, protein in the diet, not a high protein diet, but making sure that there's enough low protein diet will increase sex hormone binding globulin. Again. What is, what is a high enough protein diet? Like, is that 120 grams? Like how much is that? Oh my, you know, I'm not a big numbers guy, but in general principles, you can take the minimum daily requirement listed by the United States governmental agencies and knock that down by a good 30 to 50%. Okay? Because those, wow. those recommended daily allowances are heavily influenced by the meat and dairy industry uh, and their uh, internal studies. And um, as a person who grew up in a vegetarian environment that uh, slowly evolved into a vegan environment, um, I know people getting that, that I know a lot of people who live a vegan lifestyle who have you know, excellent health, strong muscles, plenty of protein in their diet. So most people, That's when they good. think increase the protein in my diet, they think, OK, well, I need to get some meat, some fish, some dairy. Um, uh, and there's a whole other set of reasons of what those things do in your microbiome that increase inflammation that actually would spill right over to this subject. Increased inflammation increases sex hormone binding globulin, so your hormone levels drop. And you're back to low testosterone. <laughs> right, there we are. It, it, and I, I call it hormone soup for a reason. You, you change anything and everything. <laughs> but, uh, and you know, people might ask, well, why would that be? Well, what's the thing that you don't want if you can't find enough protein to eat as an organism? You don't want to reproduce. It's going to cost oh. protein that you can't get. And when they're born, they can't get protein either. So this is a, you know, in that makes part, so much sense. A species, species survival mechanism that, that, yeah, it makes sense. And so anyway, I'm always asking myself the question, why? So yeah. next thing to look at, uh, oh, if a person is going to in, make sure their protein levels up and they're going to use meat to do that. That's that's fine. I don't. There are. I don't. I'm not a, a vegetarian missionary here, but um, make sure that your meats are raised without hormones, okay. growth hormone, uh, estrogen, and and if you're if you're using dairy products, make sure that it's from cows that are hormone free because it's primarily the estrogen type molecule that they're going to use to force increased milk production in cows. So, so just cool. yeah, your organic no hormone, grass-fed. Then you're getting away from all of those toxins that we talked about that are in the environment that concentrate in our food chain. And uh, so, uh, yes, it'll cost more money, but if it costs more money and you consume less of it, the total life cost will stay about the same. I was going to say, and um, I, I we've been bringing this up again throughout episodes here, if you're listening regularly, but does it really cost more? Because in the long run, an investment in your health now will save you money in surgeries and drugs and medications later. Uh, so it's like you invest, people are afraid to invest properly to take care of themselves and they don't realize that the cost of preventative treatment, even if you're paying out of pocket, 
is going to save you so much time, money, joy, and life in the long run. Absolutely. My older brother was for several years the president of an organization called the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. So it's a specialty under the board certification packages that focuses on being a doctor who treats through lifestyle primarily. I love it. And um, yeah, there's, there's, there's tons and tons of data showing that we could cut our healthcare costs uh, probably by 80, 90% in any given country if we just did preventive living right. But, That's crazy. but there's not money in it. And marketing it's a business it's a business at the end of the day yeah marketing public awareness is very rightfully paid for by people who are trying to make money out of the marketing um mm-hmm. as a marketer i can even say with what you were talking about the toxic uh, all of the toxic chemicals and products these huge makeup brands who are making millions of dollars by including some of these endocrine disrupting chemicals in them or even the shampoo companies why why like i'm gonna do everything in my power to not change and so it's like now you have this like incredible branding and marketing that's psychologically drawing you to the shelf of products that look pretty they're harming you so it's it's yeah it's this crazy battle right we're wandering away from the subject of testosterone but i think it's useful to think about occasionally briefly i think it's important to think about Um, marketing's not evil i mean what we're doing today we're doing because somebody's paying you to right. build a program. Uh, they're not paying me yet, but that's neither here nor there. But but they're they're paying money. Why? Because they're marketing their clinic that they want to get more people into, and that's not bad. That's that's all about making sure people know you're there and, and understand mm-hmm. what you have to offer. Um, so, anyways. I'm going to move then to the next uh, way to increase uh, free testosterone, Um, EPA and DHA. People talk about taking fish oil or krill oil, and now probably the best way to get EPA and DHA is through vegan sources that's grown um, using plankton in big, huge ponds of stagnant water um, to, to make the EPA and the DHA that the tiny little shrimp ate that the fish ate that made the fish oil rich in EPA and DHA. So um, wow. getting the getting those actually kind of manufactured or homegrown or whatever, huge lake grown sources keeps out your mercury and your PCBs and the other things that concentrate in the fish food chain. And now you can get purified fish oils that are molecularly distilled that don't have any mercury or PCBs measurable in them. Again, that's another lecture. That can be done, but you you need to be a smart consumer. You don't just go down and buy fish oil and say, oh, I'm gonna increase my testosterone here. You may be getting enough EPA to screw up your, your sex hormone binding globulin um, to counteract the effects of, of the, uh, of the uh, yeah. Anyway, EPA and DHA work by decreasing inflammation, probably, which increase, which also decreases the sex hormone binding globulin. So uh, leaves you with higher free levels. Increased soy intake probably also works on the sex hormone binding globulin. And soy, as you know, has estrogen molecules in it, plant estrogens. They aren't powerful enough to stimulate estrogen receptors much, but they appear to bind to sex hormone binding globulin and knock estrogen off if you get enough of those. in. So um, increasing soy intake does seem to increase testosterone. Um, You can shut down or reduce, not turn off, but you can reduce your sex hormone binding globulin production by adding supplements with boron nettles. Uh, and I already mentioned EPA and DHA. So those are two things that actually seem to decrease the uh, production of sex hormone binding globulin. Um, counteracting the bisphenol BPA uh, effect on the hormone chain is something you can do with alpha lipoic acid. A lot of people have heard about that. That's one of the uh, positive benefits of that. And then there is one other supplement 
on the production side that's worth thinking about. Um, and that is phosphatidylserine. Again, I'm just oh. talking about things you go in the health food store and you buy. But phosphatidylserine stimulates testosterone production enzymes. And in one study, 600 milligrams a day resulted in a 60% increase in free testosterone compared to placebo. Mm. So that's a significant increase in testosterone. Mm. So that's one thing. I mentioned at the very beginning DHEA and how that works so well for me. However, make sure you don't have the fat cells. I have had a couple of patients have estrogen symptoms shortly after starting DHEA, within a few weeks of starting DHEA production. Uh, increase, mostly increased breast size and breast tenderness. That uh, is uh, unpleasant enough for them to come back in and we stop the DHEA uh, right away. Um, low DHEA levels, and it's useful to get that level checked. Whenever I get my testosterone checked, I check my DHEA level, I check my um, estrogen levels to make sure I'm not turning too much into estrogen. But low DHEA levels, if the main problem you have is low DHEA, the solution may be just supplementing a small amount, five milligrams, maybe up to 25 milligrams of DHEA, just a small amount. Um, and uh, low DHEA levels uh, have been associated with increased mortality in men. Mm. Whether that's through the testosterone levels or whether it's independent, I'm not sure. But it's one thing that has been shown to reflect, uh, to be associated with increased mortality. Today's podcast is brought to you by the Premium Center for Regenerative Medicine and Stem Cell Therapy in the Northwest. Northwest Center for Regenerative Medicine. Get back to the activities that you love without needing surgery. You can book your appointment at nwc4rm.com. Again, that's nwc4rm.com. Dot com. This podcast is also brought to you by Rare Wellness Supplements. You can head over to rareplanethealth.com to get your supplements. My personal favorite is the premium fish oil filled with omega-3s. Again, you can go to rareplanethealth.com and get the supplements that you most need to support your health and wellness today. Lastly, this podcast is also brought to you by Rare Wellness. Rare Wellness is located on the South Hill in Spokane and is one center that provides all the wellness tools that you could need. Whether you're looking for a hands-on, premium, intimate yoga studio with a therapeutic emphasis, bar classes, tai chi classes, if you're looking for skincare treatments, injectable, hydrofacial, microneedling, organic spa treatments, if you're wanting to get therapeutic massaged or book functional medicine appointments to get down to the root cause of your inflammation, Rare Wellness is the place for you. Whatever your wellness needs are, they have it covered. So to book your appointment today, go to rarewellness.com. Again, go to rarewellness.com and mention this podcast for 10% off when you're booking. Okay, time to get back to the episode. So there's one other thing I'd like to talk about, and that is aromatase inhibition. Okay, remember aromatase is that thing that fat cells have, every fat cell has, and the more fat you have, the more of it you've got that turns testosterone into estrogen. You can inhibit that particular enzyme with a few things that, again, are available over the counter. Quercetin is one. Chrysin is another one, C-H-R-Y-S-I-N. Green tea catechins, people are familiar with that. That's kind of the antioxidant side of what's in green tea. Um, the, the, when you get green tea catechins, then you're not troubling yourself with the caffeine and the other things that might come with that. Um, uh, isoflavones from soy seem to also inhibit um, aromatase. And then there's a prescription drug that if everything else were failing, I would have tried myself if DHEA alone hadn't done the trick. I would have considered asking for a prescription drug called anastrozole or arimidex is the brand name. Um, it has been shown to raise both free and, testo and uh, total testosterone levels. And it does that by blocking the aromatase. It's an aromatase enzyme mm -hmm. blocker. So, and when we say blocker, as physicians, really what we mean is poison. Okay? Anything that blocks something in the body, if you block everything in the body of that, uh, often the body quits. So when we say right. a beta blocker, what we mean is, yeah, it 
it gets in the way and blocks those uh, beta agonist adrenaline receptors. But if you take the whole bottle at once, you might die. Okay, which in mm. you know, my my patients always told I, I, when they would say I would say hi you you know you have hypertension you have high blood pressure we probably ought to do something unless you're okay with an early stroke or heart attack and the other things that come with kidney failure and whatnot. But and I got a. Uh, uh, several ways we could treat that. I, I have a kidney poison, a heart poison, and a blood vessel muscle poison. Uh, be, and, and I would call them that just to, to help people understand this. This is actually how the mechanism through which this medication works is by poisoning things. So A, don't take more than I tell you. And, and B, I'm setting you up for, I also have another drug that will lower your blood pressure as much as any one of these medications by itself. And that, that drug is called three miles a day. And I don't care if you walk it, crawl it, or swim it. It'll drop your blood pressure as much or more than any one medication. And there's a lot of Again, good data. That. Yeah. Movement is your greatest source of medicine. Obviously, there is totally a place for everything else, right, and working in conjunction. But I think, you know, so many times people run to pills as like their easy solution before they've even tried to address it with lifestyle. Yeah. Right. And I, I'm, I'm tempted to do the same thing because changing my diet is is not something mm -hmm. that I really want to do. I like the food I eat and I don't want to eat right. less sugar. And I like my fried foods. And OK, but it's all choices. And I'm not here to judge the choices, people, Mike. I, I'm here to help people understand what are the choices. And then give them yes. solutions so that people can have agency and ownership to decide what is the best way for me to do this. Right. I mean, full disclosure, yesterday after a, uh, a delightful uh, vegetarian Middle Eastern meal uh, on our way to the theater to go watch some Shakespeare, I got this sudden urge to stop by and buy not one, not two, but three different gluten-free cookies at a place downtown that, that does a lot of really good. Now, granted, one was actually a, uh, a scone, but it was coated Sounds with so delicious but, <laughs> they were all three of them were good um and i did that knowing that this morning i would wake up with an increased back pain and increased ankle pain and my, my arthritic joints are going to hurt me a bit more for a day and that i've added to my risk for uh alzheimer's uh, hypertension but you did it but at least you did it with a conscious decision of understanding what you were doing, Absolutely. awareness, and that, and that there is a time and place for, you know, there's a balance in life. You know, you're also meant to enjoy it, but it's like do it with the education of knowing what you're doing so you can make informed decisions rather than accidentally destroying your body. Yeah. Don't live in fear, but recognize that people who are 60 years old and look like they're 80 years old are that way because of the lifestyle choices they have made. And most of them had no information, no understanding, no chance to make a difference. You know, I actually remember a patient I saw for his insulin refill. He was, uh, uh, and his diabetic pills. He was probably about a 30 year old guy. that was uh, fairly, moderately to fairly obese. And at the end of, you know, checking his numbers and writing his prescription, he was somebody else's patient. I was just, you know, there and had an appointment. So he saw me. I said, now, you, I just want to make sure that someone has indeed mentioned this to you. But, you know, this disease that you have, diabetes type 2, is reversible. You, you could be a non-diabetic. If you if wanted you to. Chose. Right. If you wanted to bad enough. And he, his response was like, no. No one's ever said that. That's not possible. Uh, it was, it was that is so sad. Blew his mind, and um, you know he came back for another appointment, and we talked about weight loss and exercise and some of the diet changes that would actually do this for him. And I don't know what he did because he was somebody else's patient, and he didn't. And my panel may have been full at that time. I don't know, but but the bottom line is that that we just don't do a good job. Even though the diabetic guidelines put out by American Diabetes, uh, I forget if it's an association, I think it's, it's the ADA. Yeah, um, yeah, but even their own treatment guidelines and, and practice guidelines that we live under as physicians, the very first thing that is recommended is lifestyle change. 
but it's never on the lecture. It's never on the ad. It's not a business. Yeah, it, it's, it's hard to make. It's hard to make money. Yeah, um, if we could pay f- physicians for a, a portion, a, a portion of the cost of the drugs that their patients are no longer taking because they don't need them, we could get a lot of traction on changing lifestyle and improving health, yeah. and it would go a long yeah, way. So but good. our current reimbursement system doesn't really allow so for that. I did want to spend a little bit of time talking about testosterone replacement because in some people it's just going to come up as a subject or, and you know, there's, you, there's a gel that you can put on your skin. The, the drawback to gel is uh, anything on the skin is that if as a man, you're putting testosterone on your skin and that skin touches your partner's skin they're and they're and they're not wanting more testosterone themselves <laughs> again i don't want to that's not our subject today but but if it's a female they're going to start getting testosterone symptoms remember that hormones mm. in the blood are measured in micrograms right per deciliter a microgram is one thousandth of a milligram a milligram is, you know, a milligram pill is one of those things you can barely get, find it to, to pick it up off the countertop. It's that small. So we're talking microscopic amounts and they go through the skin, they get right into the bloodstream. And yes, I've had uh, female patients developing facial hair growth, uh, some aggression tendencies and other things that turned out to be testosterone from their partner. So skin-based delivery is not invasive. You don't have to poke needles. But you got to watch out for how it's affecting the people around you. Exactly. So it's and it's a royal pain in the neck. Grant, I myself tried the gel first. Then I went to injections because I I got tired of the hassle of the gel. Um, oh yeah. And, and then I got tired of the injections because you have to take it out of the refrigerator, you have to warm it up to room temperature, or it's like trying to inject yep. a really really thick glue through a tiny needle. Um, right. and, and you have to do it every two weeks and with injections, of course, your level goes up for five days, then it goes down for the rest of the two weeks. And it's almost down. It's yeah. probably down below normal by the time you inject the next one. So that has led to the development of a, uh, what I think is probably the preferred method if you're going to have replacement and that is pellets. They inject them under mm-hmm. the skin. Uh, they, stay there for about three months and slowly release the testosterone and you can get pretty stable levels. They don't go up and down nearly as much. Um, You do have to go back in every three months and have them cut out the old one and put in a new one somewhere. And and now that means scars and whatnot, but uh, it's probably the the most tolerable, physiologically normal because you get these levels that, you know, level and stabilize out and physicians who do it, will make that their number one recommendation because the time required uh, as a ratio to the income received is uh, significantly better than prescribing right. injections or gel that you do yourself at home. No, this is all so great and so valuable for, you know, because these are real things that people deal with. And like you said earlier, there's just not enough education on it. There's not at all enough. And so, um, I'm really, really glad that we've been able to dive into all of these different topics. So for people listening, Dr. Guthrie, who if they walk away today and only apply one thing, they start with like, I'm recognizing maybe my testosterone is not where it needs to be. What should they do? Well, I think it's very clear from what we've already talked about that exercise and getting the fat cells volume down in your body um, is is big um and those would be the that would be if you're going to do one thing it would be regular vigorous exercise get your fat down and get your fat level down um you remember those blocks of free cheese that the government gives out that they're about you know a foot and a half long and about six inches by six inches i don't know if you've ever seen those but um mm-hmm. you know, you'll see them in in I some food banks and whatnot okay the guy who led my backpacking trips as a teenager would somehow get his hands on those. <laughs> that was one of our major food uh-huh. stuff as we went backpacking for 10 days at a so time. But that big block of cheese 
is five pounds. You lose five pounds, you lose that big block. That, that, that's a lot of impact. And people say, well, I'm only, I'm only 20 pounds overweight. Uh, yeah, that's four of those big like, blocks of cheese. That's you're like, you lose those 20 pounds sustainably, you have no idea the impact that that's going to have on your hormone levels. Yeah, it's, yeah, and your joint pain and your risk for Alzheimer's and your risk for most of the cancers yeah. that we keep track of. So there's one other thing on testosterone replacement I need to touch on briefly, and that is that testosterone therapy can is increase the risk of prostate cancer. It can stimulate the growth of existing prostate cancer. So there, if a person has known diagnosis of prostate cancer, they may choose to live with a low testosterone in order mm -hmm. to not stimulate the growth of the prostate. There is some evidence, and I think it's worth tracking over the next few years, that progesterone actually slows the growth and decreases the risk of prostate cancer. And progesterone is a hormone that it, it's considered androgenic because in women yeah. it kind of leans them that way, but it's not, it doesn't do what testosterone does in the body. It doesn't have that effect. So um, that's worth looking into. That's one thing that needs to be looked at. Um, and if um, there aren't very many men around who have a history of breast cancer, but if you do, you should not be, uh, trying to get your testosterone levels up, especially not right. be injecting it into yourself because um, your fat cells are going to turn that into estrogen, which is likely to stimulate your breast cancer growth. So that, that's uh, some things that, uh, you know, and if you have a high hemoglobin level, uh, like up at the upper end of the normal range of hemoglobin, you should not be getting extra testosterone. That, that mm. testosterone stimulates the production of hemoglobin. If you get too high of levels, there's some uh, bad downstream things that happen. So, um, yeah. And as I mentioned earlier, when you replace testosterone, you turn off the factor, you shut it down. The testicles shrivel. They actually, when you, the more I inject you with testosterone, the smaller your, tes your testicles get because mm -hmm. the the testicles say, oh, we don't need to make this stuff. Yeah, we can shut those factories down. No, we don't need it. Uh, we got plenty. Um, so replacement is, it's, it's a very real thing. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. It's a, it, it, for many people, it's a, it's a good thing. But right. to me, it should come after the things that, A, make you dependent on the medical system, which is costly and annoying. Mm -hmm. but, um, but B, ways that let your body do the things it's supposed to do as it should do them. Yes. Dr. Guthrie, this has been so educational, insightful, and um, thank you so much just for your time and your knowledge and expertise in sharing this. For everyone listening, if you want to book an appointment with Dr. Guthrie, whether it's a virtual consultation or in person, go to rarewellness.com, go to the functional medicine tab and book an appointment with him because this stuff is, as we learned today, super crucial to look at for your quality of life, for your relationships, for yourself and your longevity, your health. So um, thank you so much, Dr. Guthrie. Seriously. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I would point out uh, just the tail on that, uh, making an appointment. Um, if you're a female and you're seeing me to talk about hormones, I will do the same type of uh, discussion yes. as we've done here, maybe not quite as in-depth, but my focus will be on what can you do without having to engage a MD physician prescribing doctor to get your hormones into balance yes. first before we talk about prescription hormones. Um, even so postmenopausally, many people are able to manage their symptoms perfectly well and be quite healthy without getting prescriptions uh, to do the job. So, so good. Yes. If this episode has helped you guys, be sure to leave us a review and share it with a friend and also find us at Rare Wellness Podcast on um, Instagram and send us a message and ask us your questions so that we can continue to ask the experts your questions and answer them for you guys. Um, Dr. Guthrie, we will see you on the next podcast. Thank you so much for being on today. You bet you. Look forward to hearing from you. Bye. Yeah. Have a good one. Bye.